Well, Merry Christmas early. Hopefully everybody's got their Christmas shopping done and we're just waiting on the holiday to get here. I want to welcome all of our campuses. I want to welcome uh, Columbia. And I'll, no, no, seriously, I'm not going to say anything about the game. I just really appreciate Matt at the Columbia campus. Matt, thanks for the pizza yesterday. There was a pizza delivered at my house when the kickoff started from Matt, one of our members in Columbia. So thank you very much for the Meat Lovers Domino's Pizza and the T-shirt that I will not be wearing ever. <laughs> but thank you. Hilarious. True story. Also want to welcome, for the first time today, huge surprise, our Charleston campus. Charleston, welcome. Welcome. We're, uh, yeah. We're doing preview services in Charleston, and we didn't tell them they were getting the live feed this morning because we didn't know if they were going to get the live feed. But they're getting the live feed. So, Charleston, uh, welcome this week. Man, we're so glad you're here. Um, uh, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew 21. We're going to work over to Mark chapter 2, but we're going to start in Matthew 21. And if you've got those Hosanna bracelets, all of you probably had those, those little red bracelets. You want to hold on to those. We're going to use those at the end of the service today. Let me set, let me, let me set the service up today by providing a huge disclaimer. Um, i got to do this, and then we're going to pray, then we're going to dive right into the message. I don't normally set up this much of a disclaimer, but I, I feel like i got to do it today. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was in my house. In fact, it was a Monday morning, and I was in a hurry to get ready for, to come to, to the office. And you, many of you know what this is like when you're in a hurry. You're brushing your, you, men, many of you can brush your teeth and shave at the same time. I can do that. It's awesome. And, and so I'm, I'm brushing my teeth and everything. And I, I do this. I don't know if you do this. I cut the shower on so the water can go ahead and get hot. Anybody, anybody do that? You, you, okay. Because you don't want to just stand and cut the water. It's like, woo! And, and you kind of freak out a little bit. And so I, I do that. I cut the water on to get hot. And I'm running over here. I'm getting ready. And Lucretia and Karis had already gone. and uh, They'd already left the house or whatever. And, and then I was going to just jump in the shower and shower off real quick and, and run up here to the office. Well, what happened that morning was the night before I had taken a shower. And there was still some soap in the bottom of the shower, and I didn't realize it. So I don't know if this ever happened to you. It's really funny. Um, I jumped in the shower, and my left foot hit the, the bottom of the floor, and immediately it shot out completely from under me. Now, I, this probably took .2 seconds, but it felt like minutes because as I looked at, at, at you know, as I just kind of opened my eyes, my body was completely horizontal in the shower. I'm looking at my feet, and all of a sudden, I'm watching my feet begin to rise up in the air, and my head is going toward the ground. And I had this thought, this is going to hurt. <laughs> and it did. Like, literally, my head hit the tile, and I heard a crack, and the crack was so loud, I literally thought, Someone has shot me. That's why I fell. I, I, I literally was, this is not good. Now, listen, I don't know if they have YouTube in heaven, but if they do, this has been watched a million times. Naked preacher falling in the shower. All the angels are like, watch this, click. They're emailing email to their friends. And so, like, my head hit the back of the tile. My, my vision went blurry, and I couldn't move. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. I couldn't move. I'm laying completely nude in the bottom of my shower, and I had this thought, maybe I should slow down. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't such, be in such a hurry. I've got plenty of time. It's not really worth the pain. And I don't know how long I laid there, two, three, four days. Finally got up, and I came into work, and I started thinking, all right, God, your word says everything happens for a reason. You're going to have to show me the shower story in light of Scripture because I'm going to have to see that. And here, here's, here's what I came to the conclusion. I've been thinking about this for two weeks. Um, my physical pain Hopefully, for some of us today, is going to be your spiritual pain. Today's message is going to be a little different. Because the more, and I know I say this a lot, but it's so true today. The more of a church background you have, the more likely you are going to get highly offended during the course of this message. In fact, many of you will be tempted to walk out and leave and never come back. And here's what I would normally say. Go on. Let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. You know, I've said that before. I don't want you to do that today. I pray that you will give God, not me, just God, the next 40 minutes to absolutely work on your heart. Because here's what I believe. There will be some people that get highly offended and leave today or want to leave. But there will be some people in this camp, on every campus 
that you grasp the concept that I'm going to teach on. And here's what I believe with all my heart. That if we as a church body grasp what I'm about to teach on and fully wrap our minds around this, then the world as we know it will never be the same because God will use the people that grasp this concept to change the world. So that's what I'm praying for. I want us to stop and pray right now. I just want you to ask God to prepare your heart for the message. Maybe you haven't even thought about that today. Maybe, maybe it was just a miracle of God that you got to church today. I just want you to ask God to prepare your heart for the message, and then we're going to dive right in. So you go ahead, let's do that, and then I'll say amen, and then we're going to get started. And there's some excited people here, and there's some nervous people here, and I'm a little both. Here we go. In Jesus' name, amen. I've shared with this church before that I don't watch a lot of television. Um, I watch sports, and I watch um, uh, 24-hour news networks. And I've got to be honest, I'm going to back off on watching the 24-hour news networks because they're, they've all gotten so negative. You know what I'm saying? Negative. And listen, I'm an equal opportunity offender. I'm not just talking about Keith Oberman, who I don't think that dude has ever smiled. I'm talking about Beck. I'm talking about Hannity. I'm talking about all, they're negative. It's like the media's goal is to make all of us freak out. If I watched 24-hour news networks, I would seriously live in my basement, get bottled water and toilet paper and tuna and never and guns uh, and never leave. I, I, I can't stand watching news media because of all the negative stories. But several months ago, you'll remember this several months ago, there was a story about some miners in Chile that were trapped in the mine. You remember this? You remember this story? You remember these miners, this story about the miners who were in Chile and they're trapped down in the mines a couple miles down beneath the earth? You remember this? And it was pretty intense. Now, now I got to say this. I got to say this, and I'm just being as honest as I know how. When I heard that there were miners in Chile trapped down th th below the earth uh, and, and we, we thought they were dead, this was my thought. Oh, man, that's bad. And then I moved on. Because we see death so much on the news, it doesn't really affect us anymore. You could go home today, and the news networks could put four teenagers killed in a car wreck in Pennsylvania. And you know what everyone of you would do? Oh, that's sad. Hey, what are we having for lunch? What are we having for lunch? What are we having for lunch? We just don't even. And i, I got to be honest, whenever I see the uh, uh, miners have been trapped or something like that, and, and here in America, it's West Virginia or Kentucky, we'll see a story like that. I, I, it is bad because I can think of a hundred other ways I would rather die than suffocating to death beneath the earth. Anybody? Can you th okay, so, I, I'm that, so I, I was like, oh man, that's bad. But then stories began to come out about how these guys might actually be alive. Hey, we think some people may have survived this. And then more stories came out about how the Chilean miners were all alive. And how they were, like one, one dude had a guitar down there and he's singing songs. And they put cameras down there. And they were able to get some water to these guys. And the possibility of all these guys coming out of that mine alive became a reality. And what did the world do? The world, the world sent money, the world sent aid. The major rescue operation took place because these miners are down in the mine. And so for, for months, we, we watched this on the news. Now, just curious on every one of our campuses, how many of you watched some of the rescue of the miners? Okay, look at, look, yeah, most of us. I got to be honest with you. I got up that morning, they were like, we're rescuing the miners today. And I was like, okay, we're going to have to watch this on the news all day. We had to watch this on the news all day. And then I started watching it, and I was captivated by it. I couldn't stop watching the rescue. I came to work. I, you could watch it on your computer. I'm watching one guy rescued, two guys rescued, three guys rescued. Four, and I, listen, I got emotional, which is weird. Because I didn't know any of the miners in Chile. I've never even been to Chile. I've eaten chili. <clears throat> I like deer chili. But I've I, don't, I don't even know anybody from Chile. And I'm getting so emotional over the rescue of these miners that I don't even know. I went home that night. I'm talking to God about it. I'm like, God, God, what is wrong with me? I cry a lot more now. I mean, what is, what? And then I began thinking about it. You know why I got emotional about those miners getting rescued? That's my story. If you're a Christian, 
That's your story. You weren't a bad person who prayed a prayer, dear God, get me out of hell, and everything changed. You and I were trapped below the earth without hope. Hopeless. And God performed a major rescue operation 2,000 years ago by sending his son, Jesus Christ. And just like we had to, just like the Chilean rescue team had to send people down into the belly of the earth, Jesus was sent by God into the belly of the earth. He pimp slapped the devil, took the keys away from him, said, I will be back to throw your butt in hell in a few thousand years, came back to earth, rose from the grave and said, you, you knocked me down for three days, but you didn't knock me out. Ascended to the right hand of the Father and now rules and reigns supreme. It's the greatest rescue operation that's ever taken place in the history of the world. And if you're a Christian, that's your story. That's my story. It moved me. I began to think about those miners down in the belly of the earth. And I began to think about how hopeless they felt. And do you know that there's a world of people outside these walls? Maybe some of you are inside these walls and you don't know Christ. And here's what I know about you. You're hopeless. You've tried everything and nothing seems to fill that void in you. So I just want to talk today. I just, I just want to talk today a few minutes about something that is so near and dear to my heart. I want to walk through this story in the Bible that's always fascinated me. I want us to see how practically it applies to us. And then we're going to have one more song of worship at the end. And it's my desire that we will tear the roof off this place. I want us to see several things. Number one, I want us to see the cry of salvation. The cry of salvation. Jesus Christ had an unbelievable ministry. He started it when he was 30 years old. Um, and he did some incredible things. He fishes and loaves miracle. He walked on water. He turned water into wine. He did, he did all kinds of miracles. And the, the, the Jewish nation, Israel, began to mumble about Jesus. And they began to ask this question. Could he be the Messiah? Because, keep in mind, at the time of Jesus, when he was born and when he was doing his ministry, Israel, the nation of Israel, was occupied by the Roman Empire. In fact, the known world was occupied by the Roman Empire. And they, the Israelites, detested Rome. They hated Rome with everything in them. That First of all, they were Gentiles. And they were just far away from God, and they were polytheistic, and, and Israel was monotheistic, but they hated the Roman Empire. And so what they wanted more than anything in the world was a savior. And, and what they were looking for was a political savior. They believed that the Messiah was going to be a political savior that rose up and led the nation of Israel away from the bondage of the Roman Empire. So Jesus is getting ready at, toward the end of his ministry. He's getting ready to ride into Jerusalem for what we today call Holy Week, the week of the Passover. And, and, and if you've grown up in church, you've seen this story where he gets on a donkey and he's riding down the road and everybody's got their little palm branches and all the kids are smiling and people are going, like you've seen the flannel graph story. That's not the way it happened. That's not the way it happened. I want you to see this lens. I want you to see the story through the lens of how desperate people are. In Matthew chapter 21, verse um, 8, the Bible says this. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others, um, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna. Now notice the Bible says they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Notice after that sentence, there's an exclamation point. Whenever we read the scriptures, we should always look at the punctuation. In other words, they were not going, Hosanna. They were screaming, Hosanna. Keep, now, stay with me, stay with me. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. There's that word again. Hosanna in the highest. Now the word Hosanna was act, actually means please save or save now. It is not Hosanna. It's not just a cute word. It is a, listen, it is a desperate cry 
for salvation. And that day when Jesus rode in, they lined the streets and they weren't waving their branches and smiling. They were looking at him and they were screaming, please save us, save us now. The cry of their heart was Hosanna. And I thought about the miners in relation to this story, the miners down in the belly of the earth. What do you think their cry was? Hosanna! Their cry wasn't, hey, could you send us some food and water and some entertainment down here every once in a while? Their cry was, hey, the food and the water is great. We're freaking trapped in the belly of the earth. Could you get us out? Hosanna, please save or save now. Now go back to the story for a minute. The Israelites at the time were looking for a political savior, but here's what's so beautiful about Jesus. He always wants to save us from more than we actually want to be saved from. Don't miss that. Jesus always wants to save us from more than we think we actually want or need to be saved from. They were looking for a political savior, but Jesus wanted to do so much more in their life. They wanted freedom from political bondage. Jesus wanted to set them free and us free from spiritual bondage. So he didn't do what they wanted him to do, but ultimately he did what they needed him to do, which is why he makes such a fantastic savior. But today, we haven't learned, we're still looking for a political savior, aren't we? Come on, y'all. Come on. Remember the first time I voted in the year 2000? And I wish I could tell y'all there was a spiritual conviction that I registered to vote. It wasn't. I was watching WWF Championship Wrestling, WWE. I do watch wrestling. And it's the man soap opera. <laughs> and they had a special in the year 2000 called Rock the Vote. Y'all remember The Rock? Do you smell what The Rock is cooking? Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? <laughs> Clayton King and I have been to wrestling. Wrestling. R-A-S-S. We went to the Bilo Center, all right? We have been. I went when it was the Greenville Memorial Auditorium on Monday nights, and the Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant, used to come out. I, so anyway, I'm, I'm old school. I'm old school. And they had a special called Rock the Vote, where you could register to vote. And I said, I'm registering to vote. And I voted that year, the first time I ever voted. It was the Bush-Gore election. Y'all remember that one? It's the election that kept on going and going and going and going and going and going and going. Because everybody thought George W. Bush was going to, hey, we've had eight years of Clinton, George W. Bush will be our savior. How'd that work out for you? And then two years ago, everybody thought Barack Obama was going to be the savior. How'd that work out for you? I'm, I, I'll offend the Republicans and Democrats, all right? Libertarians are like, what about us? <laughs> you, you can't even get a candidate. Uh, so, <laughs> seriously, you know in the, two, in the 2008 election, I believe it was the presidential and Senate elections, over $5 billion were spent just on getting somebody elected. How'd that work out? How'd that work out? Come on, I'm not, listen, don't, don't send me your stupid email about how I'm, I'll, I'll attack all politics because at the end of the day, they don't save. They don't save. They don't save. We dive, in, do you, we dive into money and possessions. Do you know that America is the richest nation in the world, yet the number one prescribed drug in America is antidepressant medicine? We dive into relationships. We dive into all kinds of things, and here's, here's what I know. At the end of the day, there's a cry in this country for salvation. You and I know friends and family members that their desperate cry is salvation. They're, they are screaming from inside, please save or save now. And, and they're looking for a Savior, and the Savior that they need is Jesus. Which leads me to point number two, listen, and point number three. Covered two points at the same time. All right, point number two and point number three. Point number two is the desire for salvation. Point number three is the distractions from salvation. The desire for salvation and the distractions from salvation. The desire for salvation, the distractions from salvation. Now, now let, let, flip over to Mark 2 if you have your Bible. And I want to read you this story from a, through a different lens. This Mark 2, starting in verse 1, is one of the coolest stories in the Bible. We're going to start reading in verse 1. Here we go. A few days later, um, 
When Jesus again entered Capernaum, now this is interesting, the people heard that he had come home. He had come home. Don't miss that. He had come where? He had come, say it with me, home. Good. He had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Now, real quick, um, I believe this was Jesus' house. Now, I, listen, I, there are some people in the world that believe while Jesus was here on earth, he was broken homeless. Um, you can have a broke homeless Jesus if you want to. The Jesus in the Bible was not broken homeless. Um, and I, I know what he said in Luke about how the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He was not saying, I have no home. He was saying that following me is unpredictable. We know that Jesus was not broken homeless because Judas was the what? Come on, Judas was the what? Treasurer. Anybody know any broke homeless people that's got a treasurer? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody ever seen a homeless person on the streets rolling up with an entourage with a treasurer? If you have a treasurer, you're not broke. And Luke, I'm, I'm, so I'm just saying, if you can, that can be your Jesus. Anyway, so I believe this, I believe you could make a strong biblical argument that he lived in Capernaum, and, and just stay with me for a minute, this was his house. Now, he gets in the house of God, and he begins to teach the word of God. And the Bible says that people showed up and began to listen to Jesus teach the word of God. That's a great environment, Jesus preaching the Bible. I, I, I like that environment right there. But the problem is that, that we can get so focused many times as Christians on the people in the house that we forget there's people outside the house. We can get so focused on people in the house, we can get in such a religious hurry to fill our schedules up full of religious Christian activities that we can forget the people outside the house. Hey, reality is this here today, New Spring Church. There's people outside the house, and you know what their cry is? Hosanna! Save me! Now, someone would argue, period. We've been averaging 12,000 people for the past seven weeks. Good gosh, isn't that enough? I don't know. Let's say you had $12,000 in a bank account. Now, for some, that might be a stretch. For others, it might not be. But let's say you had $12,000, and I told you, if you'll give me your $12,000, I'll give you the potential to make $2 billion. We'd have some takers today. Now, there'd still be some skeptics. I don't want to hold on to my $12,000 here. But I would trade 12000 for $2 billion, wouldn't you? See, I'm glad we got 12000 But did you know there's $2 billion on the planet that's never even heard the gospel? Did you know that? There's 4 million people in the state of South Carolina. I would be willing to bet that around a million or 2 million of them don't even know Christ in the Bible Belt. Now, I'm all about discipleship and, and growing people up. And, and, cause pe and listen, we're about to do some stuff in the next six months to the discipleship ministry in this church. It's going to blow your mind. We're taking it to the next level. I can't wait. But the thing we got to understand about a disciple is a disciple wasn't someone that just knew a bunch of information about Jesus. A disciple was someone that followed Jesus on a daily basis. Considered every one of the disciples except John was martyred for their faith. That's what a follower of Jesus is. And so it's not a bad thing to gather and listen to the teaching of Jesus as long as it propels us to take some type of practical action that focuses on the fact there's people outside the walls in the belly of the earth. And if the church don't step up and do something, guess what? They die and go to hell. Now stay with me because Jesus is teaching. Obviously some guys get pretty pumped up about it. Look at this. Verse uh, Three, some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. I want to stop right here. If you grew up in church, you were always taught that it was four friends that brought their friend to Jesus. The Bible doesn't say four. The Bible says he was carried by four. There were actually more than four. And so they go get the paralyzed guy. Now, just, I mean, it's probably easy to bring him to church. He can't fight, all right? It's like, hey, man, you're coming to church. <laughs> and, and we can still do that today. You can beat up people and throw them in your trunk. I've got a verse that you can probably take it out of context or whatever. But you can get them to church. Now, look at this. Look at this. 
Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, I want to stop right here because there are people on every campus right now. And I know what you're, sit, you're, you're sitting there thinking, I know where you're going with this. You're telling us we need to reach our friends. You're telling us we need to reach our family members for Christ. Perry, I don't need to hear that today. I've got a cousin. I've got a father. I've got a mother. I've got a child. I've got a friend. And they won't come to Christ. And I've tried everything. I've robbed them. I've brought them here. I've given them Bibles. I've left Christian books on their doorstep and rang the doorbell and ran and jumped in the bushes and hid. I've done everything and they just won't come to Christ. Let me tell you something. Don't give up on them. Don't give up on them because Jesus didn't give up on you. You know the reason you're sitting here today? Jesus did not give up on you. And maybe he wants to use you and me to be the pursuer in that person's life, the person that you've already began to think of. See, when they got there and they saw the crowd, by the way, the religious crowd will always hold people back from coming to Jesus. Don't miss that. The religious crowd will always hold people back from coming to Jesus because they're so focused on themselves. They're so focused on the teaching, they, they don't even understand. There's a paralyzed guy out here that if we could just get him in front of Jesus, Jesus could heal, heal them. They're so, oh, that's so good. That thing in Leviticus you did, Jesus. Do that again. Paralyzed guy. Religious people not focused on application. They're just focused on information. Don't miss this. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof. Now, this is awesome. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after, what's this word say? Digging. See, I've heard people teach on this passage and say it wasn't a big deal. The roofs were tile and all they did was remove the tile and lower the guy. Then why did they dig? They they dug through the flipping roof. Okay? So, so <laughs> they dug, after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed guy was lying on. When the, Jesus saw their faith, not his faith, their faith, he said to the par paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, now notice this, notice this. They, they get there with this guy. They got him on the mat. They look. They can't get him inside, and, and, and they didn't give up. One guy was like, hey, I, I got an idea. They take him to the roof. They remove the panels, and then they start digging. Now, now here's, here's the thing. They didn't care about what it cost. There was not a finance committee over on the side going, I don't think we can afford to dig through that roof. That, die, that guy's going to have to die and go to hell. They did not care about what people said about them. Listen, they were willing to dismantle the house of God to get their friend in front of Jesus. Do you think people considered them to be sinful? Just a real quick question. Or would you consider it sinful today if you're sitting on your couch, men, watching a little NFL, all of a sudden plaster starts falling. You're like, what the heck's going on? You look up and a guy has dug through your roof and he's like, what's up, dog? <laughs> like, dude, could you, what, what are you doing? Could you use my friend? Would you consider somebody digging through your roof to be sinful? Yes, one honest man. Everybody, I don't know, maybe God told him to. Listen, I, I'm gonna need to see some ID on that God card. You know what I'm saying? These guys didn't care what it cost. They didn't care how people looked at them. And the religious people, do you think they were offended? How dare you interrupt a service that I was getting something out of to lower a paralyzed man. By the way, the paralyzed people in this society were considered, were considered cursed and people did not touch them because they were afraid they would catch the paralysis. First of all, you interrupted the service. Second of all, you dug through a, the roof. Third of all, somebody's got to pay for that. Fourth of all, you brought that guy to church. And he met Jesus, and what did Jesus do? Forgave him of his sins. Jesus didn't rebuke anybody. He forgave the guy of his sins. Now, let's think about the miners for a second. Let, let's say that people are digging trying to rescue the miners all right now I know their rescue equipment was a little bit more complex than this but work with me okay 
Let's say we're all out there, and we're digging, and we're trying to help get the miners, and somebody stops. Somebody stops, and we got this major rescue operation. There are 23 people in this mine, and they're going to die if we don't get to them. So we got, we're out there we're with our shovels, and we're digging, and somebody stops and goes, hey, 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 hey. I've been, I've been noticing the way some of y'all are dressed. I just don't think it's appropriate that we dress like that here. And somebody over here is digging, and they go, hey, hey, hey. Well, now that you mention that, you know, Frank brought a radio. He's not playing the right kind of music. I think we, maybe we should talk to Frank about his music. And somebody over here is digging, and they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I've been thinking about these miners. Are they down there because they made bad choices, or are they predestined to be down there? Somebody back here is digging. They're like, well, you know, I, I was starting to think about how much is, all this is going to cost. And somebody over here finally went, well, I'm glad you are because my hands are getting hurt and I'm a little uncomfortable with all this digging. Can we just sing for a while? And the person over here is going, as long as we don't see Frank's music because I don't, I don't like that music. And so you got all of this argument going on with the rescuers. Now, if the Chilean rescuers had responded to the Chilean miners that way, we would have called that cruel and unusual. But in the church in America today, we call that normal. We've forgotten that our call by Jesus, why did, what was the primary reason Jesus came to earth? To rescue. What is the primary call of a follower of Jesus Christ? To what? Rescue. You and I are rescuers. Unfortunately, in America today, the church has become about keeping the rescuers happy, thus letting the ones that need rescued go to hell. I'm put it to you like this. I got a friend. I got a, fr I got a couple. I got a friend or a couple. They're dating. And the girl was um, walking by me the other day. I said, what are you doing tonight? She said, oh, me and my, she called the name of her boyfriend. She said, we're going to yoga. I was like, you're doing what? She said, we're going to yoga. I was like, he must really like you. She said, oh, no, no, he loves yoga. I was like, come here, hon, come here, come here. There's not a dude on the planet. And, and if you're here today, and, and, and just shut up, because you don't like yoga there's nothing relaxing about taking your foot and sticking it on the back of your head and breathing i told her i said he he must really like you because he's going to yoga she said oh no he, listen listen he does not like yoga he likes you, therefore he's willing to place himself in uncomfortable situations just to be with you. Go back to the men in this story, dug through the roof. Did they place themselves in an uncomfortable situation? Yes. People talked about them. People looked at them weird. Religious people hated the fact that their worship service and the way they had always done things was interrupted. But ultimately, somebody met Christ and got their sins forgiven. I'm asking this question, and wait before you answer. Are you willing, as a church, to do whatever it takes to reach people far from God? Don't answer yet. I just need to know, is this church, every campus, willing to do whatever it takes to rescue the people that need to be rescued? Or are we obsessed about our own personal comfort level? I, just a practical illustration. I want to just write some stuff on the board. Um, we've been doing this thing about 10 years now, 
And I'm just going to share with you some of the complaints that I receive personally from people in our church. And I want to show you how, how this mindset, this mentality can begin to uh, take shape. For example, during the 80s series, we used <clears throat> secular music. You remember that? Remember that? Nothing but a good time. We had sparks flying everywhere. Nothing but a good time. We, we did a little Michael Jackson. A little Michael Jackson. We, we did that. And so we had people asking, well, you know, Perry, it's the music. It's the music. Can, can, we, can we you know, talk about that music now? Let me, real, real quick question. Just real quick question, then we're going to move on. It's really easy. Do you think the people in the belly of the earth cared what kind of music the rescuers played as long as they got rescued? Do you think they cared? Just come, come on now, you can answer. It's okay. So, okay, no. Um, I, so here's some of the stuff I get. Perry, when you talk about cats... I'm offended. I literally had somebody say, if you ever talk about cats again, I'm never coming back to your church. For real? Now you know why I hate cats. I can, I can listen. I, 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 like, I mentioned that I listen to like Kid Rock. Like when I work out. I can mention that I listen to Kid Rock or Eminem. And our email inbox is full by the time we get back in on Monday. Pastor listens to Kid Rock and Eminem. I've had people ask me, uh, this is right up Karis. Perry, you talk about Karis all the time. Could you please not talk about her anymore? Um, the subjects that we cover. Like sex. You know people get a little uncomfortable when I talk about sex? Oh, by the way, last week, the Q&A, I got to be honest, I wasn't completely comfortable answering all those questions. I was like, oh, well, guess we got to answer that one, don't we? But you know what the church's problem for years has been? We're answering the questions that nobody else is asking. Last week, we opened it up. We answered the questions that people were asking. You know what happened last week? People talked to people. People received Christ after the service last week. People talked to people about their pornography addiction last week. We had people get saved. We had people get set free last week. It was unbelievable, but you know, it was tense, and it made some religious people uncomfortable. Oh, Perry, the language you use. You say crap. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? You think I'm kidding? I'm trying to teach my kids how not to say crap, but I come to you say crap and sucks and did and I can't believe you do that. And let me tell you something. If you're a teenager, if you're a teenager, listen to me. Listen to me if you're a teenager. If your mom and daddy tells you not to say it at home, don't say it at home. They're your parents. The Bible says, honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother. You understand? If they tell you not to listen to Kid Rock at home, don't listen to him at home. Don't you dare get in the car that Well, Perry says crap, I can say crap, and here's Kid Rock, and then, and then, and then, and then. Don't, shh, listen, honor your father and mother so, it, so that it may go well with you. But here's what I want everybody to understand. I want you to hear this in love, but I want you to hear it in all sincerity. For the parents that email in and complain about that, I'm not your kid. I'm not your kid. You either trust me as your pastor or you don't. Because, hold on, hold on. That's about your comfort. It's not about my calling. The calling of the church was never keep religious people happy. The calling of the church is rescue. And I invite you today to either pick up the shovel and 
dig or shut the heck up. Either way, it doesn't matter. Dabo Sweeney at Clemson has a phrase called all in. I'm just looking for a church that's all in. All in. Even, listen, when it bothers your comfort zone. Because the church has decided to be comfortable. The world is in danger of going to hell. And so let's throw personal comforts out the window and be willing to dismantle the house of God and break every religious rule as long as we see people come to Christ. I mean, let me, I, I, I had these numbers looked up this week. And I, I wrote them down so I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose sight of them. Let me, let me find these numbers real quick. Do you know that this year, this year, just this year on every New Spring campus, as of last week, we've seen 3,567 people give their lives to Christ. Three thousand sixty-seven people rescued. I just want you to hear my heart. We still get this. If that's you, let me read you your story. Just want to read you your story. Luke chapter thirteen. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it. Luke chapter thirteen, verse ten. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. On a Sabbath, don't miss that. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Would this be a miracle? Would this be a miracle? Look at what happened indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Just a real quick question. Who in this story looks stupid? This guy called Jesus a sinner. Jesus healed, but you didn't do it right. And then this is what Jesus says to those people. This is Jesus. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Yeah, that's pretty good. My desire as a pastor is to see people come to Christ and grow up in him. No matter what it takes. Me and you all putting our personal preferences aside as long as we're seeing Jesus save people. Number, th number four, the results of salvation. This is where I need you guys to help me because I'm a pastor. I can't have a normal conversation anymore. Especially in the town of Anderson and even Greenville now, I'm marked. People know me. I can't talk to people about sports or politics. Nobody wants to talk to me about those things. They know I'm a pastor. Either I walk in and they go, oh, man, I was reading my Bible the other day. Or what's happened recently is people just randomly start confessing sin to me. Like I'm in a restaurant and the, wait, you know, the waiter or the waitress come up and they go, oh, it's you, Pastor Perry. And I've got my menu. They go, listen, I just want you to know I've been smoking crack. I've been looking at pictures of naked people on my computer. I've been thinking, and I'm like, What's the vegetable of the day? I just, I just, and so I, I can't do this by myself. I, I need your help. I need your help. I, it can't be me having this desire to put personal comforts aside. It can't be. It has to be us as a church because I want you to watch what happens. When people get passionate about carrying the gospel outside the walls and they bring people to a place where they can meet Jesus, this is the story. This is the story. Look at this. Mark 2. Verse, um, verse, pick it up in verse 6. 
Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? To which they were like, what are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, like you, can't, you can't play poker with Jesus, you know what I'm saying? He knows what you got. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or say, get up and take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like that. That should be church every week. House of God is dismantled. Personal preferences and comforts set aside. People are brought to Jesus. He says what only he can say. Then he does what only he can do. And people that are paralyzed by sin are set free by the Son of God because a church is willing to do whatever it takes to get them in the doors. That's church. Now, on your chair you got a, a bracelet it says Hosanna I want you to take it I want you to put it on and I want you to wear it all all through the month of December and, and don't I can't wear this at work listen if you can wear the live strong bracelet you can live you can wear Hosanna okay I want you to wear it and, and when you're wearing it I want you to do two things I want you to pray all this month, that God will save a multitude of people at our Christmas services. And the second thing I want you to do is use it as a reminder for you to ask yourself this question, who am I bringing with me to the Christmas services? Listen, church, we've got an opportunity on every campus, on every campus, to get as many people in the doors as possible. Listen, they can hear the gospel I want you to hear my heart so they can hear the gospel and possibly be changed by Jesus that's your pastor's heart I don't care about our personal comforts I care about the people trapped in the belly of the earth that need rescued. So, in just a second, we're going to stand and worship. And I know some people, this is where you leave and you get your kid and you leave early, and that's it's great. If you got to do that, go ahead. But we're about to, I want us to sing a song of worship. As we're thinking, I want you to think about this. The president of Chile. Like the president of Chile came out to the mine where the miners were being rescued. And when the miners were brought up from the belly of the earth, the president of Chile would go up to them and grab them and embrace them and hug them and welcome them back. And as I saw that, I thought about this. Church, listen to me. If you're a Christian, one of these days, you and I are going to look at our rescuer face to face. Listen, and our rescuer is not religion and it's not morality. We're going to look at Jesus face to face. And when I look at him, I want to look at him with a clear conscience, knowing that I did everything on this side of eternity to follow him and knowing that I did everything I could by the power he gave me to re help rescue as many people as possible. The song we're going to sing is Hosanna. And here's the, here, I just want to read the bridge to you. Because when we sing this, this needs to be our prayer. Heal my heart and make it clean. Let me tell you something. There's some religious people on every campus today. You need to sing that verse. 
Because your heart is consumed with what makes you comfortable and not with what it takes to reach people for the gospel. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you loved me. How did Jesus love us? Listen, he placed himself in an uncomfortable situation. If God asked, don't miss this, everybody. If God asked Jesus to go to the cross, that's an uncomfortable situation. He might ask you to endure an uncomfortable church service every once in a while. Then we pray, break my heart for what breaks yours. What breaks God's heart? Lost people. Not that we don't have 17 more Bible studies to do next week. Lost people. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I walk from earth into eternity. We're going to stand and we're not just going to sing this song like Hosanna. Hosanna means please save or save now. I want this for the month of December to be the cry of our church because when the church reaches, listen, only Jesus can heal a soul. Only Jesus can remove the past. Only Jesus can change a heart. Only Jesus can do what needs to be done for the people that need to be rescued. So let's lift this song up as a prayer and ask God, please save. Save now. We're going to sing, and then I'll be back out to shut down the service. So could everybody stand on every campus right now, and let's pray together. Jesus Christ, we know as a church that people need to be rescued. And Jesus, it is my prayer, it is our prayer right now as a body, that during these next few moments, God, that you would do something very special in our hearts. God, that you would set us on fire. God, that we would desire to see people saved and lives changed. Father, I pray for those of us who are so obsessed with our personal comforts, we have lost sight that we are rescuers and there are people that are yet to be rescued. God, may we put aside our personal preferences and focus on the commission of a Savior, Jesus, to do whatever it takes to reach people far from you. Break our hearts as we cry out to you. Jesus, please save. Save now. In your name we pray. It's the cry of our church. Would you pray with me one more time? Listen, with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Christ. Maybe that's the cry of your heart. Maybe you need a relationship with Jesus. You realize that you don't know Christ. You've tried everything and now you know you need Jesus. The Bible says that God sent Jesus Christ to take our place on the cross. And by believing in his name, that's it, by believing in his name, confessing him as Lord, that we will be saved. If that's you this morning on every campus, on every campus right now, if you know you need Jesus as your Savior, you've never received him in your life, you want to trust him with your life and follow him the rest of your life the best you can, then right where you stand today, you cry out to him and you just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross, Jesus, and you rose from the grave. And right now, Jesus Christ, come into my life. Hosanna, be my Savior, my King, and my God. Show me how to live for you, Jesus, the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Everybody may be seated for just a second. If you prayed to receive Christ today on whatever campus, listen, listen. Most important thing I can ask you to do, here's the most important thing I can ask you to do. As you leave our campus today, swing by guest services and tell them you prayed to receive Christ. We'd love to give you a Bible um, and, and, and help you take your next steps, whatever that is. If you can't do that, email us when you get home. Listen, church, listen. I just want to see people meet Jesus. In 10 years... This is what's happened. We've got campuses and people are coming to Christ in the next 10 years. Only God knows as long as the cry of this church remains, Hosanna and not keep us happy. Hosanna. We just want to see Jesus save. Whatever he wants to do and however he wants to do it. We don't believe in a system. We believe in a savior. His name is Jesus. Whatever it takes, we'll do it to see people come to Christ.
on every campus right now, I'm going to turn it over for just a couple seconds to your campus pastor who's, who's on his way out right now. Go ahead, campus pastors, get ready. Who's on his way out right now to tell you what you can practically do to help us take our next step in regards to the Christmas services. I love you, New Spring Church. I love you more than you know. God bless. We'll see you next week. All right, Anderson Campus. Well, I just want to let you know about our Christmas service times, especially. Now, as you go out, you're going to see in this atrium in the west, uh, beside, to the right side of the Awake Coffee Shop and to the left side of our resource center is going to be a table. There's also a table for Christmas tickets in the Kids Spring Lobby and in our East Auditorium Lobby. So there's all kinds of places that you can get these tickets. Now, let me go over the times. On the 22nd of December, that's going to be a Wednesday. That'll be a 7 p.m. service, and then we'll have an additional service again that Thursday, that's the 23rd, that's another service at 7 p.m. Now that service is the one that's filling up fast, so if you desire to come to the 7 p.m. on the 23rd, you'll want to go ahead and get tickets fast for that one. And we'll also have on Christmas Eve three services, that's 10 a.m., 4 p.m., 6 p.m. Now, one thing you'll need to watch when you get your tickets is on the flip side is a place where you can register for a free iPad. Now, that's going to be the way for you to maybe hook your friends into coming. So when you, get, when you give tickets to your friends to say, hey, man, just come on. You can win an iPad. It's going to be a great day, great service, and let's see what God can do in, the, in their lives. So that's the tickets. That's the sign-up time. That's the times that you can get those tickets for. And also today, if, uh, since we took up offering a little bit early in the service, you can drop offering if you didn't get to in the pin buckets as you go out. So guys, have a great week, and we'll see you here next Sunday. Have a great day.